thank you for your time. Been aware of you for a long, long time now, but your new special. Thanks, man. Kardashian. Am I yep. saying that correctly? No, <laughs> no, it's staycation. Because staycation is like vacation. And I named it that in the hopes that people would name my, uh, would pronounce my name right. But you are not alone. Any number of people in the last week have said, she has a new album out called Staycation. Please welcome Jackie Kashian. And I was like, all right, you do whatever you need to do. It's the Armenian thing that's confusing everybody, you know? Right, right. Everybody wants to ethnic it up. And, uh, and I appreciate that because uh, who doesn't? Who doesn't want to be slightly more ethnic? I mean, mm-hmm. System of a Down does. System of a Down does. They're well. They're 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 a super Armenian. They were they were. I can do food and church. Uh, I can't. My Armenian is all church related. If you need me to sing in the choir, I'm there. I'm surprised that that happened growing up in Wisconsin in Milwaukee per se. Now Milwaukee is an international city per se. You had one of the best art museums possible. You had Summerfest, etc. But Armenian South Milwaukee, church. South Milwaukee, not the most culturally advanced place in the world. South Milwaukee is an actual town outside of Milwaukee, uh, in between essentially Chicago and Milwaukee. And uh, it is a factory town, my friend. Oh, I'm not saying we don't have a performing arts center. We do. It's the, it's the theater attached to the high school. The, the, and, the PAC for industry buzz right there, you know, <laughs> fairs, festivals, PACs, but Either way, uh, no, I do. In spite of me saying the name of your special incorrectly, I do appreciate your time. Uh, how long was it from going, I'm going to do an hour to actually having this special done? Well, you know, my last album came out five years ago. You know, I am not the hero of this story from 2017. Is, yep, yep. And recorded in 2016. And so I like to put on a new album and a new, and a, and, and a special, if I could afford it, uh, you know, a video special and um, every three years. But if you do three years from 2017, you get 2020. And 2020 means lockdown and COVID and all the things that you're like, oh, I guess I won't be putting it out just now unless I want to do a studio album, which nobody should do in stand up comedy unless they're Mitch Hedberg. I don't know. Like somebody. A, a else. handful of people. I, I totally agree with you. Like, the Sandler studio albums were really good, but the majority of them are garbage. You were correct. Well, it is hard to do without an audience. So if you have some sort of musical thing or if you're super high, um, you can just sort of live in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> like if you have a guitar or you're stoned, Darren, you have an opportunity to not to have sort of a buffer. And go, oh, it's probably going well. Ding, 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 ding. Anyway. Now I know. But the bottom line is you got it done. Instead of the three-year cycle, it was the four-year cycle for this one. When, Because I've never seen you live. I've, I've only seen you on television, on streaming kind of things, and heard your podcast. When you do an hour, is that your retirement of the material? Or do you still do it for the next year or two? Oh, no. I'm not famous enough uh, to have to retire it. The good news is, is I have five albums. I'll go to the vault. I'll do anything that, uh, that if, uh, you know, cause I'm always working on new material Yeah. and whatever new material I'm working on, if it's connected at all to any of the previous five uh, albums, I will also do that bit. I don't have a problem <laughs> and nobody cares. Cause much like yourself, nobody, I'm a very well-kept secret in show business. I and- hardly agree with that one because <laughs> You're, you're one of those artists where the career that you have, uh, and this is a compliment, there's no like backhanded thing that gets attached. I say you have a great career for yeah. the 2010s, the 2020s, even the 2000s, but the career that you have in 1970 wouldn't have worked because that was all contingent, or at least this is how history has kind of put it. You needed to be on The Tonight Show and then in turn in Vegas and then hoping you had a show based around you. Now, in your case, you were one of the first comics, I think, to have a podcast, like 06, 07, something like that. Yeah. And it's kind of like that thing that, unfortunately, I think Bill Cosby is the one who coined this one. It was like, (laughs) if 1% of 1% of the people like you, then you have a career. 
You know, it's interesting that that but he didn't I don't know where he got that. He might have roofied a band and uh, gotten that from them. But the thing is, is he because bands have this have this model, right? Yeah. If you can get a hundred people to be super fans or a thousand, if you can get a thousand people to send you a hundred dollars a year, that's what it is. Yeah. If you can get a thousand people to send you a hundred dollars a year, you're set, right? That's so that's the model that you can go for in in 2006 or in 2021. But I will say this is that um, in, in 1970, there were comics with my career, which is grinding it out, working the road, making a living, but not a household name. Nobody right. knows who you are. You know, I mean, if I, I, I've been, I've been hearing stories, Jay Leno has been hanging out at the club that I work a lot lately. That guy is um that guy's a well without a bottom as far as uh yeah. comedy stories, man. It's outstanding just to sit and go, no, what was it like in 70? What was it like in 71? And that was when he was grinding it out and nobody knew who he was. And he didn't have any TV credits, but he made an okay, I mean, not a good living. I mean, he had a worse career than I did because I actually make an okay living right now. But I would say from 1984 yeah. to 2007 <laughs> so 84 94 2004 so for probably 25 years i made so anywhere between 18 to 25 thousand dollars a year in stand-up comedy in about 2007 i started getting better work i had more albums i could get more royalties so i was making sort of a more basic living it was good yeah. Um, where it was, where it was more reasonable. Like I think the first year I made forty grand, I was like, "What do I? Is you, yeah. What should I buy land?" And you're like, "You can't." But uh, thank God you're living indoors. So um, yeah, yeah. I I hear everything you're saying, and I really appreciate the honesty of all that because most people um, they don't think of where the joke comes from. Now, I'm of that minority of people who read liner notes to go, well, who wrote that song and who wrote that bit and right, what right. else did they do? You know, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that kind of person that takes entertainment way too seriously. <laughs> right. You want the backstory. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I love hearing all that kind of stuff. I like seeing the material workshopped and being perfected, not the final product a lot of the right. time. Yeah, so, or you'll listen to the final product and you're like, I remember when that had a different line. There was yeah. a different line in there. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was, I'm trying to put together some something for late night. And so I was listening to my album. And for some reason, when the line that that everybody seems to like isn't on the line on the album. I literally want to cut myself. <laughs> but uh but I'm like, it has to, maybe it's on the special because the difference between the album and the special is minuscule yeah. right because i the album can be an album can be cut waves are easier to cut than video and the video there's a there's some sort of smash cut the mic's in my other hand you know because we recorded five nights uh, oh, five okay shows. that was another question i was going to throw your way okay yeah. cool. so five shows and we used i think it was friday first show as the staple or third, yeah, I think it was, what, whatever. One show was the staple, right? That's the hour. Yeah. And then, but I told the joke a little bit better, I think on a Thursday or a Saturday. So we we brought those, that audio in. And the audio is exactly the same, same room, same number of people. So the, the, the wave looks comparable. And so audio people, of which I am not, uh, can make it seamless, right? Yeah. But video people, he filmed it five shows. But the fact that I want that Thursday or that Saturday, he's like, yeah, I don't know if I can do that. What do you what do you want it to look like? Do you want it to look like all of a sudden something weird happened? And I'm like, I don't. I don't want that. What can you do? Is there a picture of a dog that you can cut to and then come back to me? Uh, Chelsea Peretti did that in a special like two, three years ago, which I thought was genius. It was like panning in on people in the audience who weren't actually there in the audience. <laughs> I wonder who, well, that was, that's banana land. Well, good for her. Uh, yeah. Sometimes stuff is just funny. You know, I mean, sometimes you just do it because you're like, well, I want to tell this joke. how I want to tell this joke. And that's how I want it to 
I want you to hear this joke the way I wrote, the way I ideally wrote it. And then as soon as you do an album or a special, mm-hmm. uh, the bits that you've just done, uh, the best punchline, the best tag, a new angle shows up and you're like, ah, great. All right. But that's what, that's what makes the live experience so much better. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously you should see stand up live. And then uh, I do a podcast with Lori Kilmartin yes. where we talk about stand up comedy. And that is all pretty much we talk about because we both love it so and we can. But it, but it, but you're, you're talking shop. I love hearing people who know what it is that they're doing talking okay. shop with other people because they don't have to explain things. Like if you heard two professional wrestlers talking, he goes, uh, you know, and then the heel, co- oh, the heel is the bad guy. Okay. <laughs> like you yeah, don't yeah. have to do that kind of stuff. So you mentioned Jay Leno before, and something I'm really curious about is Jay Leno is the one comic who totally is anti-comedy specials. Have you heard him do that rant? I have not, but he doesn't, he has a great, I have heard him talk about the fear of burning this, the, the material because he wants, he doesn't do albums either. Yeah. He's like, uh, but it turns out he doesn't uh, have rent. So uh, the rest of us have to earn a living <laughs> and he has already earned a living and he does, I believe he does like corporates for like 250 grand. So yes, he, yes, he, he's fine financially. He he was not living off of his Tonight Show salary while he was on the Tonight Show. He was living off of his corporate gig money because he was still right. doing a hundred gigs a year while on the Tonight Show. So he's another animal. But he, I he would say that about, Jay Leno is eighty five percent stand up comic, ten percent Motorhead, and five percent human being, and. Um, and, it, and th- those other things, there's humanity there. But I would say he does not have a lot to talk about besides stand-up comedy or whatever you're driving. That's, that's so, what I've heard. Anytime I know somebody who's spent some time with him, like his publicist or at least his publicist a couple of years ago, Dick Gutman, I was going, so what's it like? And he goes, well, Jay will only talk to you for five minutes. It's got to be through the venue or the promoter. And he will just basically roast you and that's it. And, <laughs> and, but the thing that I'm getting at with Jay Leno is, I don't know if this is the most brilliant thing or the thing that you can pick apart, was he was saying that stand-up comedy specials and albums take the money out of your pocket because you're burning the material. So you're like, I'm making up a number. If you're getting 25 grand to do that Showtime special as that one-time fee, you threw away hundreds of thousands of dollars over time that you could have been doing that material on. I didn't know if other comics think that that's insanity because like what you said, I got to work. Right. Or- well, here's, here's the thing is it's, I started like, he started probably 15 years before me, but um, yes. it is, it is an old attitude. It's an older attitude that was true at the time. If you if you went on on the Johnny Carson show and did that six minutes that four and a half to six minutes, nobody wanted to hear it again. People stand up comedy has changed so much in the way that people watch. I have had a guy sit in the front row of my of my show and mouth the words along with me, yeah. which by the way don't do that. That's yeah. actually really distracting. Yeah, and uh, nice guy. But uh, and then I had a different guy this last this last special. He came to every show, even the rehearsal show, the Wednesday. He he lives in San Francisco. He flew to Minneapolis. His wife, by the way, did not fly with him. Uh, she was like, have a good time. I'll see you in a week. It's not that I don't like Jackie Cation. It's just uh, you like Jackie Cation more than I do. So he sits and he, does, and he even he's listened to the podcast enough that he knows that I don't want him to sit in the front row. So he sits middle back. He's got great seats. It's a small venue. It only seats 220, right? Which yeah. is not that small, but it, it's a perfect size, quite honestly. Yeah. And so comics, so comedy fans right now want to hear stuff again. First of all, they, they re-listen more than they ever have. Yeah. And yeah. um. And 
uh, that that might be it. Anyway, so it might just be that they read because they're it's more like not music, but like music in the way that people are like, do that bit. People yeah. consistently are like, can you do that LA bit, uh, pet bit? And I'm like, I can't, I can't remember that bit. And they're like, how about the Final Fantasy bit? And I was like, nope. I I, I got ch- I got parts of it in my head, but if I'm not doing anything else about pets. Like, like what I was just saying about going to the vault. If it leads there, I'll do it. But if it doesn't lead there, I don't have the muscle memory. Because if it leads there, then it's muscle memory. If, it, if I'm going there, I'm forcing it. I can't remember. Okay, so your, your performances are set list oriented like a musician. Yeah, uh, more so, yeah. Yeah, more so than like, have you ever seen Kira Sultanovich? She does a lot of crowd work and she has a set list, but she goes to the crowd and talks to them, you know, sort of, you know, there's a bunch of dudes who do it too, but Kira Sultanovich is outstanding. She's just really good at it. And she's in the moment talking to a person in the audience. I'm like, I don't want to, I've written these jokes. Yeah. Don't you want to hear them? Let's do it. And and I wish that I could do that, but and I could practice it, and it's probably a learned skill. There, without naming names here, we uh, I'm dialing in from Long Beach, Long Island, New York. Okay, and this town weirdly has a comedy workout room that this this comedian who's who's done warm up for some TV shows basically books it, calls on the favors, gets the comics to do it. So last night we had Jim Brewer do two shows in a bar that holds. 100, 150 people. And the funny thing about this comic is that he was a warm up guy for a living. So his material is basically crowd work. And yeah. if you've seen him more than once, then you hear the retorts on the crowd work. <laughs> you hear the same exact thing. Right, right. So right. It's, it's kind of weird that that is his specialty, whereas you're different. Your specialty is actually crafting material <laughs> over time. Well, and the thing is, is and, and there's that place in the middle, right? Where yeah. um, you're kind of making it up on the fly because people will say the same things, right? And you can have the same retorts and it can be material as it is. But it is, there is also, like, I don't, I don't, like as long, I once saw amazing improv, just the once, uh, but the, it's not that it's, because improv is genuinely hard. Yeah. And like, I've taken a couple of classes and I've been doing stand up long enough that I know, because the first thing everybody does when they get on stage is they get kind of nervous. Mm-hmm. And so they just say things. And with stand-up and with improv, when you first start talking, it's often shock jock stuff, right? You're just looking for a response. Yes. So you're going to say something gross or something mean, and it's going to be dumb. And uh, so I saw Sean Conroy and Matt Besser, who are oh, UCB yeah. guys, right? Geniuses. Right. And they are geniuses, but they are also 25 years into this, right? At no time. Did I feel unsafe? Like I, at no time did I think that they were going to not entertain me, that they were not going to uh, make me laugh or think because what they do in on the fly is something I do uh, scripted more stand up, right? Where you write the joke and and you craft it that way, but you're working that way. And it's, they take from their personal experience. Mm -hmm. So what was the day like? What was what are their lives like? What did your suggestion make them think about? Oh, you remember Uncle Jimmy and his weird job working for North American where he was an over the road truck driver? And then they tell that story and you're like, yeah. And it's never any, it's not gonna be gross. It's it's just gonna be weird at, at the at the most, at the least hilarious. It's gonna be interesting. And so it's just, a, it's such an interesting, the craft, the, 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 and I do think it's a craft and an art and all these things, but I think that the craft of it is so, how different it can be everybody. Jay Leno told a joke the other night. He wouldn't want me to tell you. I don't want to burn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's going to take about 14 grand out of his potential earnings from losing that one joke. I, I get it. I don't, know. I don't, yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> he doesn't need the 14. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and write another joke. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's, that's, I, I remember in the 90s, I was hanging out with a couple of comics, Matt Weinhold, Dave Mortal. Nobody knows. They oh, are Dave Mortal, he was on uh, Last Comic Standing. First season of Last Comic Standing. Great comic. Uh, yeah. Great comic. Yeah. Uh, Matt Weinhold, great comic. Uh, San Francisco guy has an album out that I was just talking to him on the Dork Forest and he's like, yeah, if you listen to that one, remember it was it was recorded in the 90s. I don't really say a lot of those words anymore. I take it he he had some homosexual F word nonsense. But yeah. um, but the the deal is this is that um, they were sitting around and Dave was mad because someone had stolen some joke. And it was very observational. It was, uh, and it might have been in the zeitgeist because that's true too. It was like a lot of people are talking, you know, for some reason stuff comes up. Yeah. And um, and Matt Weinhold said the best thing. He goes, "Yeah, you could worry about it, or you could just write another joke." Dave. And Dave was like, mm, "Fine," <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I yeah. like that joke. And you're like, "Yeah, you love it. You're married." That's to a it, really, it. really good point that people don't do thinking about now i'm not saying that every joke you write is going to be a a zinger per se or what's the equivalent what's a good way of saying zinger (laughs) what's a way that's not in the appalachians in the in the 30s i don't know i don't know yeah uh, they're they're not all going to be that but if that's your craft why mm -hmm. can't you practice your craft and go back to the well more and yeah yeah. And it isn't easy to write a joke so when someone does something that's comparable or the same i have this joke it's on the album about comparing, just talking about people as meat, essentially, right? Well, a woman, an Irish comic who I've never met before is in Los Angeles for a week. Same premise. Do you know why? Because people are just meat. There's yeah. absolutely nothing that can be done about that. <laughs> so uh, I have a Schrodinger's cat joke. Bunch of people have a Schrodinger's cat joke. I tag something with a telltale heart reference. Two other comics, Telltale Heart. I was like, all right, well, I guess I guess we're all living kind of the same experience, though I'm not going to reference Succession or Squid Games. So there you go. Well, what you're talking about, it, the comparable music thing would be, well, that riff appeared in that song. Yeah, but I never heard that song. How would I hear that song? I didn't listen to college radio in Duluth, Minnesota. It's one of those kinds of things. It's just statistically the probability of there's 12 notes. Right. The song's got to be three minutes long. Maybe there's a chance that Sweet Child of Mine was in another song. Right, right. It's just, there's, and you can, you can be mad about it. You can be, you can, there, there's, there's disappointment. And then there's just re-feeling, just resenting it forever. Yeah. And you're like, that's going to affect writing the next joke. That's going to stop you from actually doing the, the work. So totally. I don't ever want to stop doing, I mean, that's my, my least favorite thing about comics. And it happens a lot in comics my age, you know, who've been doing it as long as I have. They don't write as much. And they, and they you know, they have this sort of nostalgia nonsense. And you're like, don't. Look at the 28-year-old. Look at that 35-year-old. There's a golden age of comedy happening all around us. And yeah. it has been for 25 years. And probably for the 25, I was probably part of that golden age myself. 10 years before that. And Who knows? still are. Right, right. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I, I got one more quick topic for you and then I'll, I'll let you roam free. And I Thank saw you. at your IMDb credits, you're part of an Emo Phillips documentary. What? Um, part of a documentary called, I wrote down, Stalking Emo. Or are you just in the background at a comedy club where he was performing? You know what? I bet you I know what that is. I haven't looked at my IMDb. I'm in the part of show business that doesn't, uh, yeah, I would like to be uh, more active in my own career. But here's, um, I I know what that is. Uh, Emo Phillips did The Dork Forest once, and which is my podcast. Oh, they they fair use to your podcast. Yes. (laughs) That's what it is, which I'll tell you, uh, Michelle McNamara was on my podcast like four times and HBO's um, documentary about the Golden State State Killer. They use that as well. I don't know if that's on my IMDb page, but it's a better credit. I didn't write that down per se, but 
I love Emo Phillips. Emo Phillips, talk about a guy who writes, who's a genius. That guy's a, yeah. That guy's, nobody's right. His jokes, he's, there's so many great comics and they are my age or older, still writing, Mm -hmm. still creating, still doing like Wendy Liebman. Are you kidding me? Oh yeah. Um, Emo Phillips, there's, um, yeah, there's just a lot of great comics out there. Anyway. Yeah, it's great to see Wendy Liebman was i don't know who came first with the talking the under under the breath was it her or kevin nealon or is it just a coincidence that they did that at the same time any idea could have been i mean stage presence is is super addictive too so like um whenever i see todd glass or jimmy pardo on stage i end up with their cadence for about 20 minutes good cadence i hope I hope not, I hope that there's comics in between us, so I don't just have that. Hey, what's your rink? Which okay. I already half have anyway. So okay, replacement. Last question, then, and then you're free. <laughs> LA person, you were around entertainment in the '80s, '90s, 2000s, etc. David Lee Roth was known to be around the comedy store a lot in the '80s. Did you ever see David Lee Roth at a comedy club? I have never seen David Lee Roth at a comedy club. Know in your heart that I would not recognize David Lee Roth if he walked up to me and said, don't drive 55 or whatever the heck. Anyway, um, and I wasn't in LA in 84. I was in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, So you're a comedy sports, sir. No, no. The comedy cellar in Madison, Wisconsin was owned by Sam Kinison's brother, Bill. I did not know it. Oh my, wow. The amount of knowledge that you have imparted today and not just in how to correctly say your last name is just through the roof jackie so thanks for having me man